All right, welcome to the Sacramento Charismatic Podcast. Uh, I'm super excited. I'm always actually excited, so I, I really can't uh, say that I'm not ever excited about podcasting because it's fun to do. But I have uh, Melody Winderweedle uh, with me, and I said your name correctly. I, right. I feel like you need to have some. You need to make it harder though. It's too too easy. So, I know. So just like it. I'll put an uh, <laughs> yeah, you need to do something. Um, anyway, Melody, uh, you are a the co-lead pastor with your husband at Ecclesia, a vineyard church, and you are in the South. Um, yeah. I think you're in Tennessee. Yeah, Chattanooga. Correct? Yeah, Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Um, I've been there before. The food was fantastic. The music was good. I was a fan. Yeah. It's humid, though, so I couldn't actually yeah. live there, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, you've uh, how so? How long have you and your husband been pastoring that church? It will be six years in October, so about five oh, and wow. a half. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for those of you who are tuning into the uh, podcast, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening on Apple or Google or wherever you get your uh, podcasts, uh, we're going to be in the month of uh, of March and March is Women's History Day. And so uh, this month, I'm uh, pretty excited about having a number of different people on uh, to help kind of further the cause of women in ministry. Um, in fact, I do have to just let everybody know, um, Melody, you'll probably know who this person is, but I'm going to have the author of this book right here on. I don't know if you know Cynthia. I don't know her person. You know this book. You know this yes. book, though. Yes. Book. Fantastic. <laughs> so exciting. She's, she, I know. I'm like, please, please, will you? <laughs> Be on my pocket. Uh, anyway, so she's yeah. going to be on. And then I just I wanted to mention another book. So Paul and Jenner, Westfall, Cynthia Westfall for anybody listening. And then also there's a new book that just came out that I want to recommend for anybody who's interested in the subject of women in ministry, uh, but a book by William Witt called Icons of Christ. And if you haven't read this book, highly recommend it. Uh, William, Dr. Witt is a uh, biblical theologian. And uh, this book is basically a, a case for... Um, a biblical and systematic case for women's ministry, uh, women's ordination, actually, from both the sacramental streams and then the evangelical Protestant streams, too. So it's really, really great book. So that's going to be really exciting. Uh, but today I've got Melody on and I'm super yeah. pumped. You have awesome hair. Uh, you have a great story <laughs> and you guys are doing great things. I, I obviously have been following you on Twitter for a while and yeah. love, love what you um, share and speak on there. And um, so, you know, I thought we could start by maybe you just sharing a little bit about, you know, maybe how you got into ministry, um, you know, just a little bit of your story. Like for people who don't know you, what are some of the important things to know about you? I know you're married, so you probably have to throw that in there and you have kids so you should probably throw it in there too but what else like tell us a little bit about yourself yeah awesome um thank you for having me luke very excited to be here and um so a little about my story i have i'm a pastor's kid so i have basically been in ministry my entire life um <laughs> that is basically my story <laughs> but growing up i definitely had a gift for leadership it was pretty apparent throughout my life, but I also grew up in a more conservative, um, uh, theologically conservative. Um, it wasn't even a denomination. We were not denominational, but, mm -hmm. um, that was sort of the thought. And so it was very much, well, Melody will be a children's pastor or be a youth leader, mm -hmm. but like, you know, yeah. senior the you're allowed to do. Not an option. There were only so many yeah. things that I could do. Um, and then, you know, went to college and I got involved in this ministry and the president of the ministry was a woman and mm. a young woman, cause we were all in college, we were tiny, but, um, and I just remember being like, what? Like women can be like heads of yeah. organizations and ministries. And, um, that was sort of like the beginning of the journey for me to just really dig into, wait, is this okay? Can women mm. be, you know, pastors and things like that. And then of course I started going to the vineyard in Chattanooga, it was Chattanooga Vineyard. He changed names recently. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the lead pastor at the time was Jeff Anderley. Shout out, Jeff Anderley. Mm -hmm. um, and he really walked me through the, the biblical reasons for why women were um, 
allowed to or why Jesus really so, empowered isn't, isn't, it, so isn't that like such but, a terrible word? I know. <laughs> like, I allowed is like, it. oh. Yeah. <laughs> but just like, you know, I needed the the biblical background. Yeah, yeah. To help yeah. Me because I knew the call was on me and it was like, mm-hmm. I didn't want to just go on my feelings. You know, I needed yeah. the biblical um, foundation there. And so that mm. was really the, that shot me off. And when Jeff Anderley stepped down as the senior pastor, he asked Bud and I to step in. And so here we are today. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So a PK, uh, yeah. I'm raising five of those right now and I'm finding out that <laughs> it's a lot harder. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, yeah. Like it's, my my dad and my mom became pastor. They went into full time ministry after I'd already been pastoring for like maybe I don't know, eight or nine, ten, ten years, which was kind of funny because I was like, "Have you not learned anything from me? Like this is not the way of life." <laughs> yeah. uh, you had, you had a you guys, what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. So I wasn't a PK. I mean, I grew up in a very, uh, very you know Christian focused. How you know I grew up in in uh, the Vineyard movement as a kid and whatnot, but. Uh, but it's interesting raising my kids because their perceptions of being a PK is just so different than my, you know, it's a, it's a, that needs to be another, we need to do a podcast episode on just therapy for PKs. That's right. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah. Cause you I'll have my, a, yeah. I'll have my kids on it. Yes. Uh, yes. Have the kids. Yeah. I've got three kids and we're raising like expectations. Yeah. The pastor's kids is rough, man. <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's what I hear. Um, you, you mentioned biblical foundations, and I think mm-hmm. you know maybe just for a minute here, let's flesh that out. Uh, mm-hmm. So I I um, I would have considered myself. I don't know how long ago, but I would have been a soft complementarian. That would have been like my perspective. Like I would have been like, ah, you know, I think the Bible, um, you know, has no. Um, prohibitions uh, for women to be able to speak or to lead in ministry, but the senior pastor slash elder, you know, plurality of elder was kind of the world I was in uh, mm-hmm. trained in. Um, and so I was really wrestling with uh, primarily two texts. It was first Timothy chapter two, uh, and then first Corinthians 14, this random verse in the middle of the entire <laughs> chapter that makes absolutely no. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it was interesting because I remember I was very open to, um, I was really open to wanting to be, um, you know, submitting to scripture. I wanted to, you know, mm-hmm. allow the scriptures to determine my, my theological, um, you know, framework and then methodology, my praxis and whatnot. And so mm-hmm. I, I remember early on, I, I just started purchasing as many books from um, egalitarian authors that were recommended to me. And quite frankly, most of them were not very convincing uh, because when it came to the Bible, they essentially just like, well, it can't mean that. And it wasn't a really good, yeah, it was not a really good exegetical approach to the the texts. Uh, and and I really, I still, I, I think like Gordon Fee would be a biblical scholar, I think of who essentially when it comes to first Corinthians chapter 14, he, you know, his approach to that verse is that it's not original to Paul. And so I was like, ah, the, the evidence for that doesn't seem to be all that convincing though textually. So I was really struggling with that. And it wasn't until um, I started engaging, Michael Bird has a book on the subject. Um, and then I read um, a doctoral dissertation by Gary Hoag on Paul. It's a commentary on Ephesus, or I guess it's a commentary on First Timothy and Ephesus, that I became completely convinced that the biblical arguments of in opposition to women uh, leading as they are gifted just it just no longer was convincing to me to be a complementarian or a soft complementarian. So you talk about like wanting to get to the point where scripture, maybe you understood it better or the context or like walk me through that too, because I found like, I found a lot of people who were in my world were not really open to the egalitarian world because most of the time the exegesis was either not convincing or it was almost like, it's crazy for you to even care about the Bible, you know, like, Mm -hmm. let's just move on. Uh, But it sounds like for you, that was a, that was a concern. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I was one of the PKs who was like, I must do well. I was one of the rebellious ones. And so like (laughs) scripture was really important, you know, to being like a good pastor's kid and being, if I'm going to do ministry my whole life. And so, um, yeah, it's so interesting because, um, I think just learning for all of the gifts that was growing up in ministry, one of the things I think was a was wasn't taught well was how to read scripture well and mm. and just like you know hermeneutics one hundred and one. I'm not even talking yeah. like these specific texts, but just generally mm. 
yeah. considering context, considering the audience first. And then, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not to learning Greek yet. That's next semester. It's going to be but, so fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. But, yeah. um, but even so going to the scholars who have, mm-hmm. who, you know, the Greek and can give us those, I agree. Like some of the, like, well, that wasn't original to Paul arguments were a little like, it, it made me feel better because I felt called mm-hmm. to ministry. So I was like, oh, all right. Like, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's true. And then maybe I feel mm-hmm. better about it. But I guess like learning, um, you know, kind of what maybe Paul was speaking to. And and I guess like a lot of it had to do with like looking at the not so much minutia of the text as like the broad overview of like mm. Even Paul's ministry. Yeah, like, that's right. I mean, like Romans 16, he names so many women that were integral yeah. to his ministry. And it's like. And one of them happens to be an apostle. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, Which, <yeah>. you know, <laughs> that throws a monkey wrench if you're a complementarian. That, like, that doesn't fit. Which is right. why they basically you have say, to kind of say, you know, true. like they did. Well, is it yeah. a woman or, you know, yeah. Or do you? <laughs> I know. Scott McKnight's book on that. I was just talking to a, a person yesterday. Um, who hit me up and was asking, they're writing a paper, they, they're going to seminary right now and they're writing a paper on it. And they're like, do you know any work on Janiah? You know, I'm supposed to write this book, uh, this paper on her. And I was like, well, you have to get, uh, you know, Scott McKnight's book for sure. Um, but what's fascinating about Janiah, th- th- I was telling him, I remember, I, I can't remember, I have a suspicion of which biblical scholar it is, but I don't, I have to look look before I say their name. But I, I found in there, in their actual biblical commentary, they acknowledged that uh, Janiah was more than likely, based on the textual evidence, a female. There was a woman. But when that same biblical scholar was involved in a complementarian theological process, he rejected, <laughs> he rejected that based uh-huh. off of the theology. And it was really interesting because that was a perfect example of how when you let the text drive you, you arrived at the conclusion that Janiah is absolutely a female, a woman right. apostle. Uh, but if you allow your theology, your pre pre um, suppositions to control you, then you can't allow that because women, women can't be apostles according Which, to that. Yeah. Department. That whole idea of hermeneutics is so important. Like yeah. no one comes to the text mm-hmm. without preconceived notions, like to say, yeah. you know, what does it mean to do a plain reading? You know, I mean, yeah. those are have value in those sorts of things, but it's like, when it comes to like theological, you know, thoughts, it's like we have to acknowledge that we're coming to it, wanting it to say something. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? That's right. And yeah, sometimes that's, it confirms that's it, and sometimes it's mm-hmm. it's like, wait a second, you know, and are we? Do we have the humility to say maybe I'm wrong? You know. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's. I think that's great. Um, and that, I was going to also add what's amazing now, I think, is that in the last 10 years, for me, just in the last 10 years, the amount of female biblical theologians who have come out who are, you know, make, I mean, Cynthia Westfall's book, I think, is Paul and Gender is a perfect example of it, the the um, overall um the scholarship in that book is is so top notch that it's mm-hmm. it's hard to not take seriously her work, um, mm-hmm. you know. And she makes a very strong case for for females who are called by God and empowered with gifts of leadership to serve in every area of leadership. So it's right. yeah. So that's that was definitely part of part of my story. So it's interesting hearing you t- talk about that too about how you know uh, having a high view for scripture. Mm-hmm. It's like you have to wrestle with that and yeah yeah. Because it would just hard. be easy to say, well, I, I feel like I'm called to ministry, so mm-hmm. who cares about these random texts? Yeah, yeah. I think one thing I what I really appreciate about you um, from an outside, you know, social media observation person <laughs> is like you you have like you seem to have a real high value for uh, theological engagement, um, for for uh, scholarly. Um, you know, work. Um, I, I was on a, um, I was, I can't remember where, where, oh no, it was, I think it was at one of the Vineyard National Conferences. Uh, and I was on some panel as the, I like to point out the token male. Okay. I was the token male. <laughs> it was super awkward. Uh, and I, and I remember we were, we were sharing just different things about our journey into women's and in, women in ministry. And um, for me that the, the, you know, the biblical theological stuff is really what is my primary, um, is the primary force. And then also I would now add, I also am married, 
to a uh, to a woman who is co-leading with me. And I also have uh, three daughters. I have five sisters and I have a mother. And I've been around women leaders my entire life in church too. So there, there's also the observation of like, ah, oh, they're all pretty gifted. You know, a lot of them have been really good leaders. Yeah. Um, but I, but with somebody at the at the conference, I can't remember who, but basically kind of had like a, I, I don't think it was intended to be anti-intellectual, but it was almost kind of like, oh, I don't really care about the scholarship, hmm. uh, you know, and I, and I think that there is a part of me that like, I, I understand the the point of that, of, of just somebody needing to be obedient to Jesus's calling in their life and da, 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 da. But on the other hand, too, I also felt like I think it's really important that we do um, make very clear that we're not just making up this um, egalitarian approach. It's not like we woke up one day and said, hey, let's just ignore those Bible verses, you know. Right. Yeah, there's actually a lot of scripture on it. So, yes. And and to to from the oh, as a woman who felt called to be in ministry, like I was afraid to read those texts. It wasn't just like mm-hmm. I, I mean, for me, maybe not for mm-hmm. everybody, but there was a fear. Like, what happens if I dig into these texts and find mm-hmm. that there isn't room for me in that like leadership position that I feel like God's calling to me? So then so then I have to do my own like, well, then mm-hmm. what does that mean? I feel like I hear God calling. So there's a, you know, we call them clobber texts because it does feel like yeah. very, like, like it's hurting what I feel like God's calling me to do. So there's mm-hmm. a fear, I think, to, to embrace the texts as they are and, and really see, see mm-hmm. what they're, I mean, but you know, I could pontificate on that for a while, just on the idea of like, what does that mean for what we believe about God? And, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> uh, do pontificate. I, 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 seriously, <laughs> that out. Like, how does it, well, how does know, it, how does it connect for you? Yeah. So if I believe that God's calling me into a leadership position, mm-hmm. but I'm afraid to come to the text and, and, and what my fear is that I find that I'm not actually called to be in ministry. Mm-hmm. So Either I'm wrong or I'm serving a mean God, right? Why would you put these leadership abilities in me if I'm not allowed to to use it? Yeah. And so there's like, I have all these gifts and I can't yeah. use them. Yeah, where are they going? And so it's you know, and you know, a hundred percent of the time, I've misread. You know, like, but mm-hmm. there's that fear. I mean, especially when it's so deeply ingrained and. In, your calling it's like at your very core and then you know especially growing up here you're not allowed you're not allowed you're not allowed because this text and this text and this text and then to Mm -hmm. be brave enough to ask the hard questions of the text and then find oh wait this calling is actually of god and god is a good god Mm -hmm. and gives good gifts and wants us to share it with with the rest of the world yeah yeah i think that's good too like yeah the um the fact of the matter is that it feels like oftentimes we're in uh, feels maybe my observation is that we are not very good at times of seeing how everything's connected. But, mm. but when you, when you think about systematic theology in general, right? Like if a good systematic theology is rooted in the story of, of the kingdom, the story of Jesus. Right. So mm. it's like, everything is connected in some way, shape or form. And right. um, you know, I, it was interesting. I, I taught a course la I guess, I don't know if they do semesters where I was teaching, I was teaching at a university in uh, New Zealand and they, one of the students brought that up about one of the things that she found so fascinating about the, the textbook we we were using, um, engaging theology, uh, which is uh, co-written by Ben Blackwell, who's a Vineyard theologian, mm-hmm. biblical scholar, um, is sh- just how much it was all connected, you know, throughout the story. It was like it didn't matter if it was creation to to um, just a you know who God is, the Trinity to eschatology, like everything was weaved together. And um, so I think when we talk about any of these subjects, it seems like that's a pretty big big um, need for us. And that's why I think the biblical theology part is so important. Mm-hmm. It can't just be these isolated texts, like you said, you know, yeah. like, cause that's how those texts have been used for so yeah. long um, to, to prevent women from being able to use their giftings, you know? And like now I'm, I'm trying to be patient with people who I used to be, <laughs> you know, like when I was like working through it, but sometimes I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like, it, you know, the way that people use the Bible can be so, um, well, like it's a weapon, you know, it's, yes. it's used to destroy rather than yeah. to build up. And that's a problem. So, yeah. Which then um, goes back to our belief about God, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're also like your, your core belief about like 
people and how they should interact. <laughs> like, or the, fruit of the spirit. Yeah, it's, it's like something is like, can we just be nice? I don't know. Uh, so you you're pastoring, you're co-pastoring in mm -hmm. the South, though. Um, yeah. And as a uh, so I, I've pastored in a in a uh, my wife. Well, this is the way I would say it. I I was the lead pastor in a community where my wife was also pastoring, but unable to use the term because she was not recognized by that term. Um, mm. That's the kindest way to put it. But, and we, we transitioned out of that and it was fascinating to me that, I mean, multiple people would acknowledge that my wife was doing pastoral ministry and had all the giftings to care. I mean, my wife is the most pastoral person. I'm like, I'm not, she's such a good pastor. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yep, yeah, she couldn't have the term though, because she was a female. Right. Uh, and so it brought up all these different things. What, what's been your experience in the South? Because, you know, there's a lot of people that have preconceived opinions on the South. And I know Chattanooga is not some, you know, small little hoedunk. I don't know if this in, is that pejorative. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. I live in redneck California and we're glad <laughs> to use that word. So, uh, yeah. Like, what's it been like in that environment? Are there, are there people who are like, uh, you know, your husband's my pastor and you, you're just a lady. <laughs> you're his lady friend i really <laughs> like your southern <laughs> impression it's, it's not southern okay <laughs> lady. um yeah so one of the uh one of the benefits of transitioning into our pastoral role was that we transitioned and we were like build you know like we were sold as co-pastors of mm -hmm. our church. Yeah. And so it wasn't like I kind of eased into it, but started and I sort of like found, I also had pastoral giftings. And so we were kind of, that was what we were from the front end. Now that's not to say that there, uh, so, you know, there was several people who left the church purely because I was um, a woman and I was the mm. co-lead pastor and they oh, didn't, sorry. They didn't. That's okay. <laughs> well, it's no, not. It's okay. not. It's, it's not, not okay. okay. <laughs> it's not I'd okay. I'd punch him for you if I could. Yes. But um, yeah. and then we so so we had those people, and then every once in a while we'll have somebody come in. Well, we're not open right now, but when we were open, where we would have mm -hmm. somebody come in checking out the church, and I would walk up on the stage to preach, and before I could say two words, they walked out the door. Um, oh, so that wow. happened a couple of times. So there's definitely those, I have lots of stories and I don't want to, this to be negative or about like, you know, how hard it is to be a woman pastor in the South, but that, just to say it, it's hard to be a woman pastor in the South. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, um, for the people, I respect the people who l stay to listen because, yeah. um, I'm the main communicator at our church. So I'm up on the stage you know, more often than any of our other, um, yeah, as I say, every Instagram and every, uh, thing I see, it's, always, it's your, your preaching. <laughs> so, there I am. And, that's, and it's great. I, yeah, I, I, it's great. I, yeah. So it seems yeah. like that would be the case. Yeah. And so, I mean, we are a preaching team, but I'm up there most of the time. And, um, yeah. I, I respect the people who don't agree, but they at least stay to hear what I have to mm -hmm. say or are willing to engage in questions. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are always the encouraging ones. But yeah, I mean, the reality is it is difficult. And I mean, this is kind of a segue into the whole gender not issue, but mm -hmm. like but yeah. some of the some of the issues that I've actually struggled with more than the people who just won't abide me being a woman pastor are the people who are okay with me being with a woman pastor, but expect sort of um um like submission to Bud's headship in every other area. Yeah. And there's that, I guess that's the soft patriarchy kind of idea yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. there. Um, mm -hmm. and so those have been, that's been the bigger struggle, I think for mm. me. So we have more people because vineyard is largely an egalitarian movement. Mm -hmm. um, we have, most of our people are very comfortable with that idea of women pastors, but they're not always comfortable with like the fact that Bud and I function yeah. as one and as independent people. So you're talking about how, um, in some way, just, you know, maybe for anybody who is, is listening or viewing this, um, there is the perspective and it was probably a pretty common perspective, 
um, amongst early egalitarians, which is the idea that women could lead in the church, but not in the home. Yeah. It was this idea that, you know, in, in the church, women were able to, to serve in every area of leadership, but inside of the home, they had to, um, you know, essentially submit to the, the male, um, and uh, there's a really uh, you probably have read um, Fee's book. Disco- or he edited uh, "Discovering Biblical Equality." Have you read? That's the that's the answer to the Piper and Grudem book. Um, uh, you know that is laid out. But there's a there's a, just for anybody listening. I, I want to mention this. There's a really good. I'm trying to find it right now. Okay, so it's on mutual love and submission in marriage, and it's by I Howard Marshall, and he attack uh, he basically tackles Colossians three and Ephesians five, uh, and his argument on hermeneutical grounds is that you know the idea that idea of leading in the home and well uh, is also just as allowable because it's again based off of gifting and personality and, and things like that. Yeah. So you still experience that where people are okay with you preaching, yeah. but not so much making the big decisions. Yeah. And I mean, the, the whole idea is in my opinion, a bit absurd, but <laughs> saying that super graciously and with lots yeah. of compassion. You smiled. You did smile <laughs> when you said it. So it counts. But there's, there's a certain, there's, there's still that expectation. There's still, mm-hmm. You know, like, like patriarchal ideas are so ingrained in us that they come out in real subtle ways. So like Mm -hmm. in like, well, Bud and I will be interacting in some sort of situation and everybody will ask a question towards Bud rather than directing it towards they can just direct it towards both of us. I like Mm -hmm. they don't have to just direct it to me, but there's this like tendency I'm not sure we always notice it. I notice it because I'm very aware because I'm kind of like Mm -hmm. subtly and unconsciously excluded from a conversation in which I Mm -hmm. actually probably could have some really good input if they, you know, if I were invited into that dialogue. And so it happens in like super subtle ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I also too, I would assume that given your role as the lead, as a co-lead pastor, um, you know, it's not like you're only thinking about one thing at the church. I mean, you're, you're pretty involved in every area yeah. of the church's uh, <laughs> life. And so to kind of not be invited into having conversations about things about you, that you care about passionately and also have the responsibility of caring for and shepherding and leading seems like it would be. I <laughs> think that's all that makes sense. Like, why? I, don't, I guess. But yeah, I just that makes total sense. You know, um, and it's so subtle. It's just yeah, very subtle. That's that's what I've observed with my wife too. And my wife's funny because we're like, we, we what we've discovered about co-leading is that no one has a clue about what co-leading actually is, and it's different for everybody. And she's uh, she's in one of those. She's in the Lily Grant, one of the Vineyard Lily Grant things. Uh, oh, yeah, me too. Are you okay? Have you met my wife, Don Gerdy? No, I'm in the first group. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, anyway, so she, but so my wife is like, she is this, the, she, like when we talk about our gifting and I'm definitely the type a, you know, lion, she says I'm a dictator, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, no, she, she's used that word. Um, <laughs> so aggressive. I'm, I, I generally am, you know, I, I fit that profile. Uh, I'm a seven on the Enneagram. Uh, so, which means I'm a really fun, always fun, yeah. always fun. Okay. Um, but my wife, my wife is a nine peacemaker and super pastoral though. I mean, she really is like goes on walks with people and just wants to hear their story. I guess what I always tease her. She's like her number one thing to say to people is I just want to hear your story. I'm like, maybe they don't want to tell you their story. Maybe they do. I don't know, but, uh, she's just great. She's the best. Um, and it's interesting though, because our, our, when we've thought a lot about co-leading together, one thing that I've observed is that American Christianity is fascinated by the type A CEO type of personality. Like my personality fits with people's preconceived opinion about what leadership should look like. Whereas Mm -hmm. I would argue that my wife's personality fits more with what Jesus's leadership looks like and the sermon on the Mount and the kingdom. So it's very fascinating to me how um, those subtle, like, I don't know. I, I guess they're slights. It, it feels that way. I know my wife and I talk about it, you know, all the time. There's like these subtle, like, well, yeah, no, I, I care about what you think too. But so Luke, anyway, what were you, you know, it's like, 
Yes. Like, yeah. yeah. And she cares. Like she cares more than I do about whatever. Pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. <laughs> Let's be honest. If if yeah. it, like fly fishing, I'm probably caring. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So you know, you mentioned this. You, you mentioned this is the book just for anybody who's curious. It's called The Gender Knot: Unraveling Our Patriarchal Legacy by Alan G. Johnson. And I uh, picked up this book because of Rose Madrid, Dr. Rose Madrid Sweatman, uh, who is the regional leader in my region uh, of the vineyard. And she is uh, just a good friend, beautiful human being. I love her to death. Um, And she had mentioned this book and I got it and I was blown away. I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much more going on with this conversation than I realized. And you know, their example once, I'd love to have your thoughts on this. So we did this podcast. And uh, we were talking about women and men in ministry. And I, like, I, I was awakened. I'm a, I'm a hardcore egalitarian. I like, I want, I'm, I like, I want to debate that with people. I'm, a, I'm excited about it. And, uh, and like, I just assumed that we're, we've moved on further in, in our, in our churches. And they were both talking about just how for women, they have to really consider what they wear on Sundays. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, no, you don't. I was like, I, I wake up and I just put on whatever. I mean, I'm a vineyard pastor. I wear flip flops and sandals and t-shirts. And I was just, you know, and Rose was like talking about how one of the first things she ever heard after she got done preaching, I think was like, Hey, those are beautiful. Those are cute shoes. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like, Oh, that was a great message. <laughs> it was, those are cute shoes. And so I was like, what? That's crazy. And I, I just assumed that that's not reality. And, and my wife was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I always have to think about it. And I was like, what? You do? And, and so that was an example on a practical level about the gender knot, about how on a very, it's a very, it's just one of many. But I mean, like, I never think about that. Honestly, I'm like, if my shirt is ironed, I'm like doing really, really well. Like, it's a good day. It's a fancy. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I, I normally wear a hat. You know, I just, there's certain things that I don't even think about where mm-hmm. I've, I've uh, become aware that females, women who are leading in churches have to consider not just the content of their messages and making sure they're being faithful to scripture and also, you know, not speaking heretical things or they're trying to do things that are practical, but they also have to consider a whole host of other things, mm-hmm. essentially your experience. And if so, like, t- like, what's it look like? What's it, what's it been like? Yeah. Oh, okay. So much there. Um, so yes to the thinking about what I wear on a Sunday morning and it even goes, so I don't like our mics is a mic pack. So it straps to a pair oh, of pants, yeah. Yeah. but like I decide one Sunday to wear a dress. This is why pockets on dresses are <laughs> for women. It's a gift and all women, all dresses. Should have yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Things I have to think about even, so not even just like from a perspective of like impressions, but just from a very mm-hmm standpoint I have to think about what I wear so that I know where to put the mic pack yeah, uh, Ro- yeah. by the way Rose Rose has made that argument when she's preached at our church before and I'm like trying to strap it onto her neck you know and I'm like yeah, I don't know it yeah. never works yeah. yeah yeah keep going I want this is this is great tell yeah. us more so I mean and definitely like you know you, Melody, like your hair looked so great this morning or I love those earrings or whatever mm-hmm. or on the other side of it like I have to think about is what I'm wearing going to be a distraction from the words that I say because Mm -hmm. of, for whatever reason, you know, like how low cut is this shirt and like those sorts Mm -hmm. of questions that I'm asking. Um, And, and so like, that's one level of it. And then I think another experience that I have had is I am looked at more critically than, Mm -hmm. um, than our, uh, my male counterparts, if you will. Um, and the, I, I guess the assumption I have, my experience has been is that the assumption is, is that I have not done the study mm. or the intensity of the study. So when I am preaching, I make sure that I have got my like theological yeah. arguments so that, so that when somebody has it, cause I'm not, you know, we're all going to say things that are controversial and people don't like, that's just like the job of the pastor and the preacher. Mm. But I have to make sure that I've got my biblical justifications and thoughts well thought out. Because if somebody comes Mm -hmm. to me with a problem, I need to be able to say, and here's why I think that Mm. from, from, and here's how, what I said actually was well thought out. And so there's that aspect of it. And then like a third thing I would say has been my experience is um, that I'm not allowed to get angry. (laughs) 
<laughs> like I'm not allowed to get fu- well, allowed again. This is like allowed. I do. No, I, I know what you mean. I when I speak on a Sunday morning, like it doesn't happen every week, but there are times where I get. I am grieving and I am angry about mm-hmm. whatever's happening in our world today. Like, especially 2020, like, come on. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but, but as, as a woman, it's not okay for me to be angry. And that's just on the stage. Then like mm. then we start talking about like, you know, leadership meetings and stuff like that. That is, I definitely can't get angry in those. Mm. I do though. I mean, and that's a thing and it's, you know, I'm allowed to get angry just like any other human is allowed to be angry about something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But because I'm a woman, that's it's not just, appropriate behavior. Yeah. So, you're you're not allowed to to have certain emotions and right. certain expressions of those emotions. Right. Which wow. thinking about that I'm not allowed to have those makes me angry. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine <laughs> so. Like a cycle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I've wondered if like, you know, I, it's the whole concept of biblical manhood and biblical womanhood is so weird to me now. I mean, like now it's like, right. it, even when it was going on, I just never really got it. You know, like yeah. even when I probably was like listening to those perspectives, you know, a lot more than now, like I never understood the fascination with that because it, it all quite frankly, and this is, you know, this is a very sim- simplistic, maybe summary of it, but it's like Piper and Grudem basically base most of their assumptions on biblical womanhood or manhood entirely on the 1950s American culture. Like it's not at all global whatsoever. And then secondarily, it's like, it's, it's very much ignores like a lot of texts of scripture, you know, because I think that there's times where in scripture, you see, I mean, Jesus um, at times expresses uh, emotions and and feelings in a way that that in certain times of American history would be considered very feminine and very wimpy and you know whatever. Um, and I think maybe I'm, I'm a little I'm a little um, I don't know if the, what the right word is, but maybe sensitive to that because like my whole life as a kid, like I've I've always if I am if I don't cry a lot. But I'm not. I but I do. I will. I will cry. You know, if I start talking about something that's you know very deeply moving, I will. I'll shed a single tear. It'll roll right down. Uh, you know. But yeah. I remember as a kid. Yeah, it's like just one. <laughs> but I. Uh, I felt like as a kid, I was not. I was. I, there was something wrong with me because of that. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I need to man up, quote unquote. And um, and you know, so upon upon inspection of scripture, it seems like wait. You know, I think the more healthy you are, the more that you're going to be able to be comfortable about expressing emotions and feelings. And so I think that what you're saying, it does cut both ways too. It's not just a, it's, it's very fascinating. The gender knot is, is patriarchy is bad for men. Yes. Like it's bad that's for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah, not yeah. the system. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's so you, so you've experienced uh, that in the local church and, and in leadership, um, in a number of different ways. So those, yeah. those, those, I don't know, I guess the little, the, the roots <laughs> go deep and it's, it's been, so what's the, what, what's something that gives you, where it's brought a lot of, a lot of encouragement and hope, you know, as a female leader, you know, where you've, you've seen either somebody's perspective change or, you know, you feel like, you know, you, you you have hope for maybe the next generation or what are some things that are giving you a little bit of hope in life for, the the um, goal of wanting to see anybody, whether they're a female or a man, who's gifted and called to be able to step into leadership. Yeah, such a great question because we could spend a lot of time on all the bad things. So, like, where's the hope in it? You know? I'm tempted <laughs> to do that, but we got to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So some of that is like my daughter, who is six, will always know a woman pastor. Mm-hmm. And we have a group of children in our church who that is all that they've known. So where I came mm-hmm. was introduced to it much later in life. We have a group of kids. So like I have extreme hope for like the, our, the younger generation who are coming up yeah. and don't know anything different. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just like basic. Um, but wow. then also you talked a lot about like, um, you know, I've got, you know, I've got a man up, you know, it's not okay for me mm-hmm. to cry. And so just from, from the male perspective, like I, I am seeing more men willing to 
be honest with their feelings. Cause like, like that's the, the other mm-hmm. side of the coin is that like, you're not like to have feelings as a man that aren't anger is mm-hmm. you know, detrimental. And so I have seen in our church community, like very locally, our church community, like our men's group, again, before COVID, like they would meet and have breakfast and like share feelings and like, mm. <laughs> so, and it was like, it was really a beautiful and exciting thing to witness. Yeah. And healthy. And healthy. <laughs> like, yeah. But like, it took them a while to get like, yeah. like I'm an open book and let's go. But other men, like you saw the progression and like the comfort level, like, oh no, it's okay for me to be mm. like, you're okay. And come into this space with other men who care about and are going to pray for me and lift me up. And so that's been another really great thing. And then lastly, like, uh, I just will randomly get, messages from other women who are just like, Mm. thank you, you know, or (laughs) your words really affected me or whatever, you know? And so I I posted this on Twitter the other day, but like, if you ever feel a nudge to encourage a pastor Mm -hmm. or a leader in ministry, like do it because they need to hear that encouragement. Like we, it's a hard job. Or, or checks, checks, cash, uh, chocolate, (laughs) money. uh, I will also take money. (laughs) <laughs> Misty, bottles of wine. I, I mean, I could, the yeah. list could go on. Any yeah. of the above, just go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how we, I mean, cause I think about that my, for myself too, how, um, when I'm, when I'm most in line with the Holy spirit would be the best way to say it. When I'm like, when I am uh, abiding and connected, my the most consistent thing that I feel led to do is to just check on people and to and to express concern and care for them. It's like, well, you so know, good. yeah, and I did that once last year. So it was like <laughs> one day I was really connected to Jesus. It was such a great day. <laughs> it was a good day. <laughs> yeah, I was really connected. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I just think that that's um, such that's such an interesting observation and experience that you had though with with. Um, you know, the power of, of how like female voices can also be a really encouragement. I think that that's something that again, the gender now we're talking a lot about this because it's uh, such a relevant thing, but I've been surprised about how many women are, are not champions for women empowerment, but also can be some of the biggest, um, I guess, uh, you know, critics or, or not just critics. I think sometimes it goes beyond critique. It's actually like, you know, the most oppressive, um, are female voices, you know, and you see that in certain complementarian, you know, fundamentalist, uh, uh, I guess traditions and worlds, which I'm not really a part of. So I'm always like on the outside laughing. I'm like, Oh, that's hilarious. (laughs) Um, it's so entertaining. Uh, but, but it's actually sad, you know? And, and so has that been, you know, something you've also experienced? Have you, have you found some females are actually less empowering and less encouraging to you operating in your gifting? That's first question. Second question. Why do you think that is? Oh, okay. So yes, again, like when I mentioned a couple of people who left our church community for either soft patriarchal reasons or just like, like you're a pastor. So we're out. Yeah. So I think of a few who left women um, who were, just not, they were just like, Melody, you're just not, you know, that's, you're just not, you're being disobedient. Right. Mm. Um, And the reason I think that is, and I could be wrong, but I think internal oppression is very real. And I Mm. think I have, I continue to fight and experience that as a woman um, because I think we've been taught a narrative our whole lives and Mm. uh, and so we begin to believe that we're not worthy of the mm-hmm. gift that God's put in our lives because we're not, we're told that we can't do those things so much so that we believe it. And we're mm-hmm. afraid to, like, it feels better to tell everybody else that they're also not allowed to rather yeah. than their own internalized, like yeah. lives that we've, we've been. Just to, to acknowledge your, um, calling and gifting may have to um, cause them to admit that they've been either lied to and oppressed. And I, th- and I think subconsciously people don't want to admit that they've right. been duped. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, you know, so that, so that has been, and that's yeah. part of your, your experience with that too, huh? It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've always been fascinated by that, about how some of the most ardent, 
complementarian people that I that I know and have interacted with are are uh, females. Which, and this is what I think is interesting about that. This may be controversial, but most of the time, my observation on those people is that those specific ladies are actually not functioning in a complementary way either because they're so willing to debate the Bible or theology with me. And I'm like, just submit. Um, no, I don't say that. But, you know, it's 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 amazing to me, though, how uh, how it's it's like when you look at their even their marriage relationships yeah. or how they function, they are operationally um, uh, egalitarian, which and then uh which is an interesting thing because I still think that most complementarians fundamentally do not understand egalitarianism because it's like right. Wayne Grudem's whole thing is egal evangelical egalitarians. He just conflates that with radical feminism. Like they're the one in the same. Right. And so, um, you know, like it, it's the assumption that egalitarians are saying that men shouldn't lead and women should only lead. And, you know, every woman should be a leader. Whereas the egalitarian, you know, perspective is actually completely gift based. It's all yeah. about calling and gifting. So, you know, it's it's not about whether or, you know, we would say it's about gifting, not not gender. Versus, you know, gender is always the leader. You know, and one's always the follower. Yeah. Um, so that's what I that's my experience with those those ladies. Is oftentimes they are not <laughs> complementarian. What you're doing right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> talking about them. I know it's so hard not to just poke holes in that too though i'm like you really yeah. just need to submit to my well that's actually one argument i made one time with somebody who was attending our church i i was like okay so how you know according to your your perspective it should be a group of of men who are discerning together as a plurality of elders and pastors who are discerning together doctrinal things and i'm like okay so let's i'm i'm actually a huge advocate for plurality of elders i think that that is probably the most consistent biblical church government structure we see. I don't think it's required because the Bible doesn't command it, but it's definitely one of the options. I said, so let's just pretend for a minute that all the elders who are male in the church determine doctrinally that females can also be elders. What are you going to do there? It's like, <laughs> well, they're all false teachers. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I give up. I There's no winning. Uh, okay. So, um, you you could talk to me about uh, external and internal impressions when we were yeah. uh, privately on our Twitter texting, which I didn't even know that was a thing, by the way. I don't even know what that is, but DMing. Is that what it is? DMing? Yeah, I don't Private like, messaging? You know what DMing sounds? I don't know. But I, it sounds are. weird. I know. But we, whatever it was, uh, we were emailing through Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm 42. Okay. That's what I have to say. Uh, I was sending texts through Twitter, but... Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Is, is that connected? Cause I'm sure that's connected a little bit to what we're talking about, but what do you mean by external and internal? What are the internal and external expressions or impressions uh, that are connected to the gender dynamics and the patriarchal gender? Not? Yeah. And I think that there's the real obvious external oppressive things. Like we talked about earlier where people, I walk up on stage and people walk out the door, you know, that's a very external. Okay. Yeah. Everybody sees it. Everybody's seeing it. It's very obvious. Uh, um, you know, I had a attempted a conversation with two men that came into the church and it was very horrible and in, in which the conclusion was that um, I wasn't living a godly life. And so I asked them very politely oh. to leave my church. Wow. And so, you know, there, I think you, you, tw you, didn't you send a Twitter, I a tweet did. out? <laughs> I remember this. I was so like, floored by that. I could not believe it happened. Like you hear stories and then it's like, Oh no, that just, that happened to me. <laughs> just yeah. Now. It just, um, it just always proves that there are actual morons out there. There are people <laughs> that are complete morons. Just, yeah. So yes. Yeah, so those are the very like external. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. But, okay. But there's also the externals that I think are the subtle ones. The, the, like the expectations that I won't get angry, the expectations mm. that, you know, um, I have to do, I have to be very much more thorough in my studies, the expectation that, you know, gotcha. um, I'd rather be out shopping than in an elder meeting or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, those sorts of like yeah. more subtle or just directing all the questions towards, but those gotcha. are external, but they're a bit more subtle by internal gotcha. oppression. I think about like what happens inside of me because of the narratives of patriarchy Mm -hmm. that we live in. So mm -hmm. a, a bit about like what I mentioned earlier uh, a few minutes ago with this woman who to, to say that I was walking in my calling meant she had to wrestle with 
her own. Yeah, her her own. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And I know okay. for me as a woman, the question is always. I talk to Bud about this all the time, where it's. Um, was somebody critical of me because what I said was inappropriate or were they critical of me because I'm a woman? The, mm. That's a constant question that I'm always asking. Gender always is a factor in all of the things. So I have yeah. to pull out those like, and then it's like, Oh, Oh no, I said in an appropriate thing and I need to apologize or, gotcha, gotcha. or it's like, no, but it's like a lot more. It's okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it just seems like a, it's a lot of extra pressure on top of the other the normal tra- challenges that would be related to passing. Yeah. And I hope you know that's kind of what I'm hoping um, you know listeners and viewers will really wrestle with for this month. You know, just that there are it's more than just um, one's one's understanding of scripture and the overall theological stuff. There's this practical pastoral component yeah. that. Um, I don't know. Like, I really, I really uh, like have a lot of respect for you and for any other woman pastor, just because it's like, I assume it's probably way harder and way more challenging than anything I would ever have to experience because of all those, those subtle things. And I guess that's kind of maybe a good way to think about when you talk about external and internal impressions, there's like extremely aggressive um, if in your face things. And then there's these subtle um, things, you know, so like the macro micro aggressions, yeah. I guess maybe other yeah. ways we would talk about that mm-hmm. when you talk about ethnic diversity and racism right. and whatnot, but, yeah. um, okay. So let's, let's, uh, transition to another topic that I'm really excited about hearing you talk about, Excellent. uh, and it's about politics <laughs> because you're in the South. <laughs> um, and yeah. I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions, but and I, for anybody listening, like I jokingly, say that where I live, it's California and everybody assumes like, oh my gosh, it must be so progressive and liberal. And I'm like, well, a lot of California is, but I happen to live in Calabama. So it's extremely, um, it's just a conservative community. And so I like that description. It's, it's the, I stole it from another vineyard pastor. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah but we both have the same plight, but, uh, yeah. So it's like, it's interesting because I find myself, I've always lived in states that I would consider purple in mm-hmm. that they were not one color dominant. You know, they were, there was a mixture of every perspective mm-hmm. and I, and I, so, and then 2020 happened, um, actually 20, uh, you know, 2016 happened and then 2020 happened. Yeah. And it seems like in the last five years, there's less purple, even in purple. Yeah, there's a lot more polemical, hardline right, uh, hardline left, um, and so you made an interesting uh, statement about the nature of the kingdom and the color of the kingdom, and yeah. so flesh that out a little bit. Sure. So to give you a bit, so Chattanooga, it, the c- city limits of Chattanooga is actually extremely blue. If we want to use that word, Tennessee yeah. is a very red state. So. Yeah kind of live kind of the opposite of what you have. We kind of, and I forget that sometimes because I'm right, Mm -hmm. right. We live in, in the city. And so I forget sometimes, you know, with yard signs and we have a mayor coming up and yeah, yeah. like, I'm like, we're doing great. And then it's like, what happened? Um, yeah. So (laughs) politically speaking, but, um, so this all kind of happened. um, Uh, our church was, is, so even though Chattanooga is kind of blue in a red state, we our church is relatively diverse. So mm-hmm. p- Democrats, Republicans, reds and blues trying to do yeah. life together. And, you know, we started pastoring right, <laughs> like right uh-huh. when the election season of 2016 started. And yeah. So a lot of intensity. And, um, you know, I was just like, how do we, hold this tension like how do how do we be a purple church with such like opposing and like the longer we were together the more we broke you know because it is like Mm -hmm. just the what's been happening in our political climate is just insane just completely Mm -hmm. pulling apart and pulling apart like how do we hold this purple tension and and I just like one day I was having this conversation with one of my mentors and she was like yeah you just kind of have to say like we're a purple church and I got off the phone with her and I was just thinking through that and I was like so, but if we say that we're a purple church, the implication there is that that we hold to some very Republican views and some very Democratic views. And like mm. those views echo the kingdom of God, but it's not one or the other, but we pull from both. So it's just purple. And I was like, I actually think that that's not the case. I think actually the kingdom of God is yellow. 
because there's no red or blue in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is altogether different. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there are echoes of it in, in our political system. Like, you know, however, whatever you want to say about that without naming like issues right off the bat, but like, but the kingdom of God doesn't work within a political system. So we work within mm. the kingdom of God system, which is a whole other upside down nature, you know, kingdom mm. of God. And so that's sort of like, that's sort of the idea that like mm. our, our churches shouldn't attempt to be red, blue, or purple. Our churches should attempt to be yellow because we're going to bring something to the table that's all together, together differently. And mm. frankly, in the political climate that we live in right now, I think it's actually really easy to be a yellow kingdom because we're the people who are loving regardless. <laughs> we're just loving mm. regardless if we're doing yeah. it right. You know? Yeah. That is, uh, I have to tell you, Melody, that's the best explanation of uh, the kingdom's politics that I've <laughs> literally ever heard. Um no, truly, like I'm stealing it from you. I'm gonna say I started it too. Everybody heard it. Well, my husband and I are writing a book about it. So Oh, I better get my book out fast. Uh <laughs> when's just coming out? No, I I uh, here's why I think that um that and I love to have you flesh that all the more. So like I there's a great book by uh Carl Truman called Republicrat. And he's a Brit. And I liked the book because he just does a good a good job of fleshing out about how both um, political platforms have good things that they bring to the table. And, and uh, you know, I, another book, um, James Mumford's Vexed. I don't know if you've read that, but you should definitely get it. James Mumford, Mumford, you know, the Mumfords, it's their, uh, their son, the, the only Mumfords that matter. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but yeah, the, the James Mumford's uh, book Vex is fantastic. Uh, and just about how, you know, each political party, we've we've bought into the lie that we have to agree with everything that that political party is selling and we can't, you know, nuance things. And so um, so I've been really influenced by by that world. And I, I've always been thinking, I mean, I really do believe that the kingdom of God is so altogether other compared to political systems in, in the U.S., um, but I'm uncomfortable with the like Anabaptist Methodist just don't engage in politics at all type of approach. <laughs> and I'm also really, really concerned about both the extreme progressive um, worldview and perspective and ideology, as well as the extreme right perspective and ideology of, you know, Christian nationalism and Republican, Republican Christianity and all that stuff. Like, I think they're all something's I just don't feel like those are best representative of of, you know, what our allegiance should look like and then our political um, engagement should look like. So you're going to, you're going to sell me on this yellow thing. What, <laughs> like, what is that? Why yellow? First of all, why yellow and not why, why not, you know, any other color that's on the color wheel? Why yellow? And then secondarily, like, what does political engagement look like yeah. in a yellow kingdom ideology? So primary colors are red, blue and yellow. So those are mm -hmm. primary colors, right? So no other colors inform those colors. And so no you, green, you don't get any green. No green is a secondary color. I know, but so, yeah. oh, I see. <laughs> green tables, my color. Okay. So, so it's just, it's just because it's the color on the color third, wheel. It's the third primary color on the color wheel mm -hmm. and no other colors inform it because it is altogether different. So that's the idea behind that color it goes back to, you know, I was really hoping you were going to say some super spiritual thing like the sun. Or the that. Sun. that <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I, was, <laughs> I thought you had like some prophetic dream. Okay. No. So it's just because it's the third color in yeah. the color spectrum. I mean, and my daughter was in kindergarten learning about primary colors. And so I was yeah. in that space. And so <laughs> uh, it's obviously been a very long time since I have been in that uh, color wheel. <laughs> but. Yeah. So that's yellow, but I like the idea. It is the sun, you know, both the S. You can dedicate the book to me and just say shout out to, yeah. Okay, so it's because it's all together, all together different, all together different, and none okay. of the other colors inform it. That's the like that's the deal. Mm, I love it. So, it's even yeah. better than I assumed. Okay, yeah. so what's the what's political engagement look like in this ideology? So that is the question, though, right? What does it look like? And I think. So I grew up in, again, a conservative environment where my pastor told me I turned 18 and got to vote right after I turned 18. 
And they were like, just vote the, the Republican ticket. Yeah. Because that's what Christians do. Yeah. And, and that was Christian party. It's the Christian party. And that was my lens. And, um, I mean, if we're, we're spitting out books, I just finished Jesus and John Wayne, which is in very, (laughs) it's a, for those of you out there. Yeah. Yeah. It is an intense and very disturbing read that just kind of. It's true. It is. Gives she definitely has a perspective and she's definitely telling a story from her perspective of history, but there's a lot in there that is like that has been my experience. Yeah, um, I, I yeah. just I just completed uh all of these right here. Oh my god. <laughs> to to fully understand Christian nationalism. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> and uh yeah. deeply disturbing. It's very disturbing. And yeah. and and I think you're right too, because then if we if we say that we're not that extreme right Christian nationalism, then we must be the extreme left, which is equally problematic, right? Mm-hmm. Because the extreme left also isn't the reflection of of Jesus, yeah. the kingdom yeah. of God. They they have their problematic issues too, and you know, sanctity of life. And those mm-hmm. is the first one that comes to mind. Um, and so I just think about how I engage it, and, and this takes work on the part of the Mm -hmm. paper and that is to do research. And like, I I think we cannot be one issue voters. I think that's like, Mm -hmm. I I don't think that's helpful. Um, I I think we have to like, what is it that we care about? What did Jesus care about? Right. Mm -hmm. When you read scripture, what, who, who is Jesus advocating for? And, and, and how does that reflect in, in the political sphere? And Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we have, we need to be afraid to, preach political messages. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we need to, I think, and, and that's not to say I'm going to get, I know you've done that. I mean, I, I know that you have waited. <laughs> I, I've watched some of them like, Oh, well, <laughs> there you go. Melody. I have an opinion. <laughs> Apparently not afraid to share your thoughts. Uh, okay. Well, let me, let me flesh that out a little bit or get you flesh that out. I, I obviously don't know what to flesh out cause I'm still learning, but uh, let me, let me, for the sake of our, the argument, so you say, you know, we shouldn't be single issue voters, which I largely agree with, um, because I think that's what's kept the church from being able to engage in political, um, in politics in a way that's probably been helpful and more robust or holistic. That'd be maybe a good way to put it. But at the same time, it feels like, you know, um, when like in, especially in today's current political climate as also with the state of where the world is at and with all of the um, recent clear and explicit um, examples of racism that we have seen over and over and over again, it does feel like there still is a significant amount of, of uh, folks who are saying we shouldn't be single issue voters, but at the end of the day, their single issue is generally related to um, race and ethnicity um, and identity politics, politics in general, which I, I want to say or ask, I guess, more so like, so yeah, maybe not single issue voters, but how do you, at the end of the day, we are prioritizing certain political issues above others. Like, I, like there's certain things like I won't take a paper cut for theologically. Like if someone was like, oh, you know, the preacher rapture, like I am not a preacher rapture dispensational guy. I have been saying consistently that the vineyard should not be dispensationalist <laughs> and it's not and and all that type of stuff. Uh, but I'm not going to take a paper cut. Like, I don't care. Like, OK, cool. You read Left Behind and it was the most convincing theological work you've ever read. Congratulations. Um, but there's other, there are other things like Christology that I would, I would die for, you know, like that's where I'm going to say, no, we're, we're going to, Jesus is fully God, fully man, or the, or Trinitarian theology is really concerning to me. But when, when politics, like when you think about this yellow kingdom approach, um, how are you, how are you, how are you wrestling with being a non single issue voter, but yet at the same time too, you're prioritizing certain political topics and issues, I would assume, or maybe you don't, I I guess that's the question. Yeah. So just to clarify, I'm not telling my church who to vote for. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about like, let's not, that's your first mistake. You you need to give out a card every Sunday, letting them know who, (laughs) no, but I, (laughs) so when I, I do think, yes. So when I, for me, and I think this is where we have to have a better understanding of what the 
role of the body of Christ is. So we mm-hmm. all have our roles to play the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And, and so what, what's passionate for me is going to be different than what's maybe passionate for you based on like what God is calling you to do mm-hmm. as okay. your part of the body of Christ. So like, that's where the issues that I'm going to vote for in my community. So it'd be, I mentioned earlier, we're about to vote for mayors. Like, so I'm looking at like police reform and I'm looking at like better access to transportation for um, the underserved communities. Like these are the issues that are important to me because it's Mm -hmm. the community they care deeply about. That's not going to be for everyone. And so I guess it's like that sort of tricky thing of like, uh, in one sense, your voting is going to look different than my voting, but I also... Mm, There's not the, you know, so then I vote for the mayor and then put it all on the mayor or our local government to Mm -hmm. make good on their promises because as a kingdom of God person, I have my role to play in all of that. And so Mm -hmm. what, what am I doing to better that? How am I also serving my community and being the church to my local community? Do you know Mm. what I mean? There's this like politics play a part because that's a world we live in and there's, in my opinion, no way to separate our politics from our Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's all part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Yeah. And so, so I prayerfully go and I prayerfully do my, my study of the issues of the people who are voting. And I, and I don't do the straight Republican ticket or a straight democratic ticket, mm-hmm. frankly, but I'm looking at, <laughs> and then, mm. and then am I, and then at the same time, I'm called as a, member of the body of Christ to do things. And am I also doing those things to better the community that I serve and to bring the kingdom mm. of Christ to the community I serve? So it's very, and like nuance is a thing. I nuance like it. Yeah. Thing, you know, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and we can look at all the numbers that we want to, and we can, you know, uh, look at the stats about different, like, you know, I think about the issue of abortion and, you know, I am mm-hmm. a pro, I am pro-life right? hundred percent. I also know that like most abortions happen in mm-hmm. with who are in poverty. And so yeah. poverty actually plays a role in that. So it's not just like, <laughs> yeah, make abortions legal. It's like also make it easier for like people in poverty to have, yeah. children. you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah, this yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, isn't that like the whole, the thing about abortion, uh, this, so I have done a little bit of a reading on this. Um, so I can't say like, I, there might be a different, um, uh, s- studies, but from what I understand, abortion rates go under or go down under uh, Democratic presidents in Democratic a- administrations, um, and and oftentimes it's tied to the social uh, services and the provision that happens under Democratic platforms and administrations versus on their Republican presidents who are pro life. You know that that's what they sign on to and say, and I believe that they generally are. Um, but the abortion numbers go up or don't go down. And so it's interesting because I would think if you're a pro-life, the, the argument would actually be, hey, we should all vote Democratic because that actually minimizes the number of abortions from happening, um, you know, which I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, go ahead. There's just a correction. Abortion rates have been going down since the 80s, regardless mm-hmm. of the president. But they okay. drop more drastically under Democratic because of okay. the. Okay, yeah. Of- that's yeah. That's I, I was under Obama. I mean, I think under President Obama was the was the most significant yeah. Um, yeah. drop, right? Yeah, which you know you can't have that happen because he's a Democrat. <laughs> that's what they say. So there's so much nuance, and I think that's mm. part of what's missing in the whole. Honestly, frankly, our like the way this that's happening in the church and our political mm. climate, like, is because we're unwilling to imagine that there's nuance to these issues or that there's more than just a yes or no legal or illegal Mm -hmm. question to things. Mm. I I like, I like it. Um, Yeah. It's so you're talking about, it sounds like it's a going to require discernment as a a community Mm -hmm. um, and that some people may be more committed to certain issues or, you know, we'll prioritize those over other ones and that you're going to have a community where, you know, people are going to respect each other's um, perspectives. Yeah. Good luck with that. I hope it works out. Uh, <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> we, we've yet to be successful, but there's hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like pastoring is mostly ideolo- ideological. <laughs> We're like, ideally. Yeah. Ideally. People yeah. are 
really well. No, I love it. I, so uh, you're writing the book. Yeah. And do, are you, uh, do you have a publisher? Are you looking, you're going to cross that bridge when you get there? We are in such the early stages. Bud and I are just mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to write together. Oh, <laughs> that's that's my wife and I right now. <laughs> that's been a, <laughs> we have this, like, we have like that the general outline and we have a mm. few things written down. We, we did like a blog series in the fall of 2020 that kind of surrounded right. this idea to just sort right. of put thoughts out there. Mm. So they're on our Ecclesia vineyard.com website. That's great. That, but yeah, no, I, I think I saw some uh, of those links. Um, I don't know. What was that a year? Not quite a year ago. A year ago. Yeah. 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 Um, um, wow, that's amazing. So, so like the Yellow Kingdom is is a thing, and you've been um, trying to do that in your local church and yeah. learning about how sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Again, ideally, we're willing to hear that maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I I that's what I love when I when I read your when I read you say you talk about this idea of the kingdom is yellow. Yeah. Um, I just was like, oh, that's, that's what I've been trying to, that is what I've been trying to say. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've been, cause I've been using the word, um, uh, holy other it's, it's altogether mm-hmm. different. It's, it's not, it's the kingdom of God in its nature is fundamentally unique compared to the kingdoms of this world. You know, like, I mean, Jesus's words, my kingdom is not of this world is that you couldn't be any more clear about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, knowing that I have enjoyed pastoring more so in purple communities though, <laughs> rather <laughs> than red or blue. Like, cause I would, I would, I, I would say if I was living in an ext- extremely progressive cultural context, I mean, there would be other fish to fry versus, you know, the things that I have to uh, address in my cultural context. You know, like I think I would probably be engaged in a lot more conversations about identity and, mm-hmm. and uh, gender, um, you know, issues and like, those are, those are addressed here, but it's different. Like it's not rooted in, you know, the left's, um, left's approaches and ideology in our communal community context. So, um, yeah, so I, so I really resonate with your yellow, yellow kingdom. I can't wait. The book's going to be amazing. Um, yeah, I just, I'm prophesying that right now, Lord. No, um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you'll receive that and successful. Well, uh, Melody, it's been such a such an honor to have you on, and um, I I think it'd be fun. I don't know if you would be able to talk your husband into doing this, but I'd love to have um, my wife and I are trying to figure out the whole co pastor thing. Like we've been doing it for a long time, because even when we when she was not allowed to be uh, a pastor, we were. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Like, like it just, we, we always have it. And part of our transition was, you know, really sensing that God was calling us into like being in a situation where we were like, it was for real, you know, and, and I had become a really convinced egalitarian. Um, And so anyway, we we're definitely exploring a lot about that. And, you know, it's funny because I get asked all the time by not just vineyard pastors, but pastors in general for resources on co-pastoring. And there just are, Zero. I, I've not found anything. Although I did find a book I wanted to see if you would want to check out. It's called The Pastor's Wife. Um, I, th- I thought yeah, somebody gave that to my wife a long time ago. Oh, bless it's your wife. It's literally the worst book ever, but um, <laughs> it's actually not. It's it's not the worst, but it's it's very it's very not where we're where we're at. Uh, anyway. So there's not a lot of books out there on it and there, but they're, but it's like w- with co-pastoring is an interesting thing because it raises a lot of dynamics because not all, you know, you had Willow Creek as an example of a church attempting to at one time have co-pastors that were not married, um, right. you know, and then you've, but the majority are probably married couples, but I think there are other, other examples, you know, that would have co-pastoring situations where you're not married. And so addressing that, which is what we're hoping to write a book we've, we've sketched, ideas out and um and are looking to kind of crowdsource so i'd love to yeah. see if the four of us could have a, a hang time podcast record drink some beverages and just rant we would love that that'd be, be fun it would be super fun. fun. yeah i mean your your husband by the way has such an epic beard i feel like we need to get that out 
we need it captured. <laughs> yeah, we need we need that to be seen and experienced in all of its glory. It's true. <laughs> uh, okay, so if people want to stay connected, follow, um, you know, be be able to, um, you, you know, know what's going on in your life, uh, you're on Twitter. Yep. At Melly Winder. Yep. <laughs> and you also have a website www.melodywinderweedle.com. Uh, what are, are there any other ways to stay connected with you? Uh, I'm on Instagram too. And it's Melly Winder also I'm on Facebook, but I'm not really on Facebook. So that's not really, <laughs> that's, that's everybody. Right? <laughs> it's like I go on there, I post and then I get out. <laughs> yep, exactly. Exactly. Uh, your church though, uh, your, your, your church's, uh, details, like how do people follow you on, on, uh, Instagram and, and I don't uh, you, you do have a Twitter uh, account for your uh, church too. Yeah. How, what are those? Uh, Ecclesia Vine at Ecclesia Vine for Twitter. And it's Ecclesia Vineyard on Instagram, Ecclesia Vineyard on Facebook as well. So great. Yeah. yeah. And so for anybody listening, um, you, there's a lot of, you have sermons on there. You have yeah. sermon clips. You've got uh, your, your Instagram account's great. Uh, you guys do a really good job. Of I will tell posting my stuff. Said that he works. Yeah. Tell him. <laughs> Two thumbs up. Uh, yeah. Well, hey, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Um, we look forward to being able to do that again. And we're looking forward to the book. And when you, uh, so we're going to do a podcast, the four of us. And then we will also do uh, one once the book is dropping. We should uh, expose everybody to that too. So yeah. thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. Hey, uh, for those of you tuning in and listening, thank you so much for listening. I would encourage you to leave a review. Um, it would be really helpful to leave reviews because more views and more listens happen that way. And that will be one step closer to me being able to quit being a pastor and being a full-time podcaster, uh, my and fly fishing podcaster. That'd be the best. Uh, yeah. Living the dream. All right. Thank you everybody.